Anyone? Who wants to go first? Andy, you look like you're yeah, going to jump in. I can go for that. Um, I mean, I think when I look at what's happening across the whole space of um, consuming content, I mean, clearly we're getting a lot of this content on our phones now and on tablets as well as our TV, but I still don't think we've really cracked a sort of ubiquitous experience, if you like, across all those platforms. I still think there's a problem with um, easy discovery across all the people that are creating content. I think that's a big problem that has to be solved. I think when that is solved, um, you will see other platforms like car-based platforms being included in that whole ecosystem so that you can consume that content as easily as you can, maybe not so easy as you can on your TV at the moment. Um, I think digital signage is really interesting because I think from a technology perspective, um, ubiquitous computing and embedded devices in the environment have been coming for a long time now. Um, and I think this might be the thing that makes them actually um, tip over the edge. So we start disaggregating some of those devices. We don't have everything built into one device, but we use a screen here and a radio there and a mic here and a speaker there and sort of get, a, get an experience from our environment, not just from the city. And are these in the middle of a long list of development uh, opportunities at Motorola or are, they, are there engineers worrying about this right now? Um, there have been engineers worrying about this for quite a while. It's been in research labs. I think um, we were discussing earlier that a, a lot of these things that we see coming to fruition now have been built in part of projects for many years now. We've just been waiting for the right business model. So I think all of this technologically is possible. Um, we just need to get beyond this discovery problem. Um, a sort of single sign-on identity, which has been several runs at that, that we haven't, haven't quite um, fixed yet, and the business model, and you think this computer is going to take off. I think identity is uh, in sort of related to experience and that it could create a personalized experience for you, but I think there's two pieces coming from the mobile side um, that I think will contribute to this um, you know, single unified experience, one being responsive design, which I think is a very early precursor to how content can be presented from a single source in different size screens and experiences in different ways. And the second actually being cloud uh, computing and how your very uh, sort of computing, uh, a sort of uh, intensive uh, applications can basically come from the cloud and then be shown in whatever different areas um, based on the capabilities of that that particular screen or device. So those two, like I really think responsive design, especially for content, like when you don't have something super rich where people are like navigating through uh, a graphics engine, but rather just watching or, or, or browsing or, or reading, that could definitely be very helpful for that. I mean, I think just to emphasize your point on cloud, it's not just how you get various parts of the content to different devices. Um, if you're going to do that successfully, you need to be able to personalize it, which means user profiling, right? You need to understand about the immediate situational context and, uh, uh, you know, of, of the person who's consuming it. Um, and you need to know what the, what the media is. You need some sort of semantic understanding of the media because you don't want certain media slapped up on some TV screen when it's a private call from your wife or something. Perfect example is like, how many of you use Siri regularly, put up your hand? See, nobody does. Um, now, when I drive, <laughs> when I drive and I use Siri for the only time I need it for, and she fucks up and says that she has no cellular connection and can't help me, um, there's like, what it does actually, if it's Bluetooth connected, um, so normally if you ask Siri to dictate a text message to someone, it'll just show you the screen to verify what you just told her to, to type for you. But uh, when you're connected to Bluetooth, it'll actually detect that you're connected to Bluetooth and read you back the message that you, she thought that you just dictated to her. So that's understanding that you're in the context of being in a Bluetooth setting where you may need to hear it back. So that's really cool. And just little examples like that, if we can have that understanding the context of where you're interacting with the content, is awesome. Cool. Content, guys, what, how, how, how hot is this for you? In terms of content and in devices? It's you know, our yeah. digital signage and point of sale in store. You know, I shudder to think of, of somebody watching one of our programs while while driving down the road at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> or reading uh, a magazine. Or reading a magazine, either one. I, having it read to you, maybe one of our HowStuffWorks.com podcasts, but 
sometimes I think it's uh, we're grasping at straws and overthinking what paradigms might be out there. Uh, I remember seeing pitches for uh, in-panel refrigerators, and I think LG possibly has been shipping some some refrigerators. And I ask myself, why wouldn't I just want to have an iPad sitting on my kitchen table or my counter, or if I'm really desperate, figure out how to how to use some sticky tape and hold my my iPad up on my refrigerator. I want some hunk of junk that's going to be outdated and embedded in my refrigerator that's going to have a 10, 15 year lifespan. So I think we have to be very careful about sort of what types of contents or content is really relevant in, in a device other than sort of uh, tablet, uh, tablet, laptop, TV. Even though I'm representing content, my interest in those channels is more from a marketing perspective. That, you know, the experience of reading a magazine in a, in a car, for example, is not very practical or the assignments, but the audience development channels that we have access to to get our content in front of consumers are fairly limited. And, or I should say, those that are effective are fairly limited. And digital signage in particular is pretty interesting uh, as an opportunity. Yeah, I, some of the marketing networks, like in restaurant and food courts, those environments, I, you know, it, it makes sense to be able to distribute snippets and teasers and... In airports, I mean, ma magazines are sold heavily in airports. Digital signage and our active magazine experiences tied to a, uh, a screen that can be updated, that can be richly interactive, simulating them. One, one of the things I think is very interesting about the two um, areas you talked about, the car and the digital signage, is that exactly because we're talking about second screen experiences, connected devices, TV plus iPad plus phone plus laptop, those two areas of, of outdoor signage, specifically I think, and in car, are, are, are some of these last vestiges of attention that you can get from the consumer. Right, so if I think about that example where you said you're driving at 60 miles an hour down the road, I think you actually have uh, you know one real opportunity to reach the driver, which is that your 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 audio channel and your traditional radio or, or Sirius or XM or whatever. And you know at the same time, I mean I've got banner blindness and I've got a TiVo skip button on my remote control, and I know there's a lot of advertising people in here, and we're you know funded by a content company primarily. But you know I, I've developed a lot of ways in which I can ignore or skip uh, a lot of advertising in all of these channels. And in fact, it feels easier and easier to in some ways. Um, but you know, I still can't avoid uh, the bus or uh, the subway or the hotel lobby. Um, and, and so I think what's interesting there is that you now have this you know, sort of growing scarcity of uh, you know, attention where it's whether you're sitting in an elevator, and I think Captivate's an interesting thing there, or in a mall or, or food court you mentioned. Um, and so, so I, th I think those are pretty interesting opportunities for, for marketers. Cool. Um, for your purposes, um, what do you want Facebook to do in mobile? It's a big, this Friday is going to be a big day for Facebook, for uh, anybody associated with Facebook. Um, but we know that mobile is a bit of a blind spot for them right now. For you all sitting right here, for your, for your business, what would you like to see uh, Facebook uh, follow through on in mobile? Um, how about, let's start with Chris. Well, I'm gonna come back to the marketing channel. I mean, that, to, to me, represents a huge untapped audience for us to take these great content experiences that we have both on web, via mobile, and via apps, and make them more shareable. That's not been easy to do via mobile channels. Right? We, can, we can do a lot via our websites, and certainly do, and it's starting to pay dividends, and drive more referral traffic, and provide more value, aside from just the audience. But we haven't seen that effect yet on the tablet side of business. So, so I guess on from a technology's perspective, I'm, I'm very hot on you know understanding people's context and their behaviour. Uh, I think Facebook obviously have a huge amount of data on the way that people engage with media with each other. Um, I also believe there are a lot of other companies in the world, Amazon, Google, whoever, who also have their own islands of data. And I think at the moment everybody's trying to monetize that data. But I think the big win is when we figure out how to connect those islands of data so that you can create truly compelling uh, sort of media experiences. So I don't know how we do that without you know, uh, grabbing onto their data because it's so valuable, but whether it's by processing or anonymizing or whatever that data, allowing that data to become connected, I think would, would drive the next set of uh, sort of TV 3.0 experiences. And that may solve the discovery issue you were talking about, I think, in some ways. And we still haven't, I think, truly proved like 100% 
that your social data on mobile and on desktop should be reflecting a value to you one and the same. What I mean by that is how you interact with social on mobile should in what way indicate what may potentially be interesting to you. On desktop, I think it's different. On mobile, I think it's different. Um, obviously biased, I want them to integrate some kind of a reciprocity effect where people actually get something in return for doing things that they're uh, already doing on, on Facebook. So if you're sharing a lot of food pictures, you should get some kind of a food reward, stuff like that. Um, that's the vision we see. It's going to continue to grow. I think this is inevitable, um, especially in mobile. Espe when mobile, when you look at the, the way that it's developed as, a, as a, obviously an interaction uh, schema, you know, it's really when you when you have a phone, you're doing shit with it, right? You're not really just sitting back and watching a four-hour movie with it. So when you're doing stuff with it, that activity is constantly indicative of something. And um, I really do want to see that data become, um, you know, hopefully some way horizontal, uh, and then kind of see that grow from there. I actually want to pose with Pal, maybe we can get a vote going, but speaking of Facebook, um, I haven't heard a lot of Facebook phone rumors recently, um, but as you think about the platform companies in the Valley maturing, Amazon has their device with the Fire, Google is, you know, in two ways now in the, in the mobile, uh, mobile phone uh, race. Does Facebook build a phone? What do you think? I Mike think will. Yeah, they will. My guess is no. I guess, yes. I, I, I guess no. No. Yes. yes. It's going to be right. I'll tell you why. It'll be, it may not be a Facebook branded phone <laughs> that comes from them that they produce as hardware, but it will be a hardware partnership where their OS, I mean, just, just come on, guys, they just launched an app store. Right? I mean, and they're going to go and, and, and use the social data to inter, interweave sort of the, the, the content recommendations and make everything dynamic. And, and the, the social layer is ever more powerful when they look at your address book. I know it sounds creepy, but it's not like Path didn't do it already. Um, and uh, sort of figure out ways to, to really tap into things that really truly uh, indicate the most raw uh, early steps of social, which is your address book. I think that's the most it's, important thing. It's been tried before, I, you, not to mention any names, but we've seen this before with big media brands, and ultimately, as much as people love Facebook and probably will continue to be uh, users of Facebook, I, I just I don't see people switching devices and phone companies for... Did anybody in the audience own an ESPN phone? Uh, <laughs> anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody get that ESPN phone back in... Uh, what was it? 2000. One or something, or is it 2002? So, so I think the reason I said no was, I think the control is currently in the OS, right? Um, you know, having a branded Facebook phone, I don't think it gets you anywhere. You know, in the same way that Google has embedded search as the primary thing of Android, you know, maybe Facebook would love to have an OS that has sociality in it at its core. But I think we're sort of full up of OSs right now, right? There's no room for them. I don't think they need a phone. What they need to do is get mobile right. The, the platform already exists. The distribution already exists. They have a sticky presence via the web. They don't. They didn't need to watch a web browser, for example. They don't. They don't need a phone. I don't know what mission they work on. Uh, Twitter beat Facebook to the punch for being the social layer, or at least some kind of a sharing layer for iOS. And so I think um, that type of envy may induce some type of a experiment, and then. Like Apple does, they call it a hobby, and if it fails, it's a hobby, and it failed. But if it doesn't fail, then it's a successful project that they initiated and thought up from the beginning as being so brilliant. Keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, exactly. You, you asked before how many people use Siri. How many people would buy a Facebook phone if one was on sale tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> one guy. The guy who thinks they should do it. I think ESPN is the example is a sports specific app. I think Facebook spans across I was just all of us. Yeah, no, I know. I know. I'm, I'm picking on it for a reason. I think Facebook spans basically, I mean, it's just insane. I mean, everybody checks it every day. Much like you will go to Google every day. And I look at Google as a parallel of many reasons because. I think search is something Facebook has still got to go and try to hammer out before they even do something like this, too, because they haven't done the social search stuff thing properly at all. They're using Bing as a search partner, and it's depressing. But they can certainly do a lot better. Yeah. I'm Sorry, Microsoft. No, that's absolutely consistent. 
Um, let's talk for a second. Uh, we we brought up a moment ago the cloud. Um, I think for content owners, I think for advertisers, um, uh, create once, distribute many is a goal. Um, it's not realistic, but it's it's certainly a nirvana. It's a goal. Um, but at the same time, shouldn't things uh, be custom created for mobile? I mean, isn't that bad for our purposes to create once and distribute many? Is the cloud um, a little bit of a red herring in that uh, we don't necessarily want our television content or our print content to just be uh, forcefully distributed out to the mobile uh, platform without some kind of quote unquote mobilization to it. How do you guys feel about it? Is it uh, unreachable? Is it is it unanimous that it's got to be customized for mobile? What what are what's what's going on? with some of the factors? So I'm I'm going to answer this since we're in New York as a as a member uh, proud member of the New York tech community. I think one of the things that the cloud has done specifically is um, move the bottleneck and sort of the rock star status from the uh, developer and the infrastructure side to the designer. And I think mobile highlights that. Um, and so unfortunately for many of the geeks in the audience in the world, um, it's no longer uh, a differentiator to be able to build and deploy these apps and have the plumbing work right and have the infrastructure scale. There, there's still problems to be solved there, but I think when you look at the successful companies in mobile, it's really the ones that got the UI and the design right. And so if I look through all of our portfolio companies, the portfolio companies of my friends, um, you know, in, in both in New York and San Francisco, I think the real differentiators, the, the, the people they most are desperate to hire are the great designers, and that's particularly true of mobile, although I think it's also happening in the web. And so I, I would argue that, you know, the cloud is the enabler, it's the democratizer, but it just shifts the um, the, the sort of focus to how can we now make stuff actually look and work and function well on different devices. Yeah, uh, I'd agree. I think there is, though, a lot of um, hybrid talent, if you will, where there's engineers that have a design eye and, 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 and designers that maybe have some engineering capacity as well. But, but yeah, every experience needs to be really purpose-built by device size and OS. So whether it's phone web or tablet web or native application, each one really needs to be different. I think responsive design, to your point earlier, it's there and, and slowly growing in terms of capability, but I think really uh, to get ad serving right, to get analytics right, to get the UI right, particularly if it's very app-like and not just, say, reading an article, you really need to, to focus on a, a very specific experience, even for the browser, even for the phone. It needs to be different than your regular website or your tablet website. For our premium products, our consumer paid products, design is a big part of what we deliver. So it's essential that we customize those designs for the screens. What's essential for us, though, is to pick out the screens of value. We're, we're for example, selling more of our content on tablets at seven inch sizes and 10 inch sizes, obviously, as opposed to a mobile phone. So when we put a lot of effort and energy into design, it's really with those screen sizes in mind which is a different approach than we take for a small screen mobile. But yeah, the tablet inherently, you have a bigger canvas, and so it's just inherently a more complex exercise. Yeah, it's, it's harder to differentiate what we do on a small screen where the canvas is so tiny. Well, we actually have some interesting diversity here within content between Hearst, Discovery, and Bertelsmann. You know, when you've made an investment in, frankly, linear content, how does that get reimagined for mobile consumption? When you need to monetize a, a rather expensive infrastructure to build linear content, what, what are the options in mobile by the time you get to uh, various devices and various screens? How, how do you monetize that? Well, first off, we do it very carefully, <laughs> uh, with, with a lot of care and a lot of thought, and um, we get better at it as the months go by. We uh, just recently relaunched the way we do popular mechanics, for example, and we'll soon, uh, in the next six weeks, relaunch the way we do Cosmopolitan. And it's a singular design created with a 7 and a 10 inch screen in mind that the average reader would not 
look at it and think this is something that is blown up or shrunken down or stretched in some way. But that takes, again, it goes back to very carefully designed, very carefully thought out templates that strategically use white space or dead space in areas that would be trimmed on smaller screens. So, I mean, from a technological perspective, I think um, any, you've got to concentrate on experience, you've got to concentrate on simplicity, which means that you know, the experience has to be tailored to the mobile. What interests me is when you talk about templates and things, how much of that production can I automate? Um, and how much of it can I personalize? Uh, and maybe not for the premium apps, you know, if you've got a um, Super Bowl app, you're always going to have, you know, somebody doing a very bespoke design. But if you're looking at back catalogue um, and you're looking at shows which are, you know, perhaps not with the highest um, viewership, then I think you can do a lot with automation these days to get you a long way to something that is, uh, you know, um, <coughs> tailored for the mobile and tailored for the person. In, in terms of, you know, again, we have, you know, a number of networks, Animal Planet, TLC, Discovery, and, and other brands, military. As we're moving forward with, with apps and, and mobile web, tablet web, there is definitely an amount that can be templated because we want to have a family resemblance across them. And luckily, we're building a robust API infrastructure, the services infrastructure that allows a video to be a video to be a video, whether it's Animal Planet or Discovery, it's coming from the same infrastructure. It makes a lot of sense. We're, we're heavy users of templates in a lot of environments that most readers or, or users don't necessarily recognize that there's templates. So, for example, even within the print magazine, we, we have lots of templates, but the pages look entirely different because the guts of those templates are much simpler than I think we're used to thinking about in terms of traditional digital on the web. All right, let's change gears for one second. Uh, are people going to pay for content in mobile that's free online? They are already. At scale, growing. Hey, do, you, do you have to clarify? Do you mean for a specific brand or when the, where there is quality alternative? Tell, do, it's only relevant to how it relates to your business. Tell us about your. I, where you have a differentiated product, and I'll leave that you know up to people's own minds as to whether Discovery or any other brand has a di differentiated product. But I, you know. I, I think we have a uniform approach to it right now, and I think brands, my, my former employer, the New York Times, there's a bit of a consistent, uniform approach, and I think that's the direction that most people need to take, that if you are charging for it on the web, you're charging for it in a native application. If you're not charging for it you know, on, the, on the tablet web or the phone web, then it's gonna be much harder to monetize it in app form as well. I, I'll, I'll disagree slightly since you asked for some, some controversy here. I, I mean, I think ultimately things have to converge um, one way or the other, and I'm not smart enough to know which way they go, although I suspect that paid content's going to be a big part of it. Um, I mean, if I look at the television ecosystem right now, and you, you know, use an example, the, the exact same stuff that's free on Hulu on my laptop, I have to pay for on my iPad or my connected TV device. Um, and, and, and so, in a sense, they're, they're not charging for content, they're charging for convenience, right? So it's inconvenient for me to plug my laptop into my TV. So that's an intermediary step right now. But I, so I, where, where I think the, the, uh, the uh, ecosystem is at today is the fact that the mobile devices, and to a certain extent the connected TV devices, have embedded pay systems, right? So I, I mean, I, I cannot underestimate the value that iTunes built just by selling uh, music, because it got how many hundreds of millions of credit cards? And the problem is, how many credit cards does the New York Times have, does Discovery have, do our magazine brands have? You know, it, the, the fact of the matter is, online, no Nobody has, except for Amazon, who has who has credit cards. And so the easiest, least friction way to monetize a consumer is through advertising. Whereas as you start to shift to platforms where you have the credit card, then you can start to charge. And so the question is whether it's through some form of pass or subscription, and who knows what the future holds in that respect. Maybe there is a, an easy pass kind of token that you can also carry with you on the web. How many of you guys are using Newsstand? Sorry. Newsstand. First is using Newsstand. No? 
what you're saying, because that's the subscription thing you're talking about. I don't know if it's really catching on, right? Because they, I think the, the, the way the revenue drives most of your businesses is advertising. And obviously, obviously you've got you know, your, 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 your subscription models too, and then Apple's taking that 30% chunk. So I don't know if that was the most appealing thing for you. In the, in the consumer magazine business, you know, most I'm not sure here, I've spent a lot of time in the traditional side of consumer magazines, but a 30% cut in a marketing channel like that is actually a pretty small cut traditionally in that business. That's good. Newsstand has worked well for Hearst and has cool. helped this scale. And we'll, we'll finish this year with a, a million or more paying digital customers through awesome. newsstands like the Apple newsstand. That's not the only one. Yeah. We sell a lot through the Kindle Fire newsstand, through the Nook newsstand, and others. And, uh, you know, that's that's $20 million in revenue for us. That's not necessarily the scale of many of our other businesses, but it's a very good start. It's good. Um, let's talk about gaming and gamification for a second. Um, so there's a difference. Um, we could talk about a gaming bubble, but also there was an enormous amount of discussion about gamification of everything, uh, even a year ago. Um, has this simmered down? Is this no, no longer a burning uh, opportunity or issue for you guys? First, let's talk about gamification. Speed round, do you give a shit? We do. We've experimented a lot with it inside of the pages of our digital magazines where we can have interactive experiences like that. It's been great for engagement, but nothing beats the engagement of a great story. Reading is still one of the more engaging things. Agreed. The experimentation continues. People are still interested, but content is king. I would agree with that. I mean, we don't actually get involved in gamification, but we do study it a lot. And it seems that there was a bubble, but people are getting fed up with it now. So if you want to continue gamifying, you need to keep it fresh and do something new. And being the mayor of... 72 Mercer isn't good enough anymore, so what's it going to be next? You're always running, sprinkling to keep ahead of that, that reward. Yeah, I, I personally am a little bit tired of the gamification mindset. I'm going to steal some of Brian's thunder here. Um, I, I think it's more about real world um, rewards. Um, and so, you know, we have a portfolio company called CrowdTwist. Um, that you know, focuses on loyalty in a space where I think a lot of people have talked about gamification, and I think ultimately, you know, people want to be rewarded for their actions. And you know, maybe it was getting points on the leaderboard, but I think it's a lot nicer to actually get real stuff. So yes, we give a shit, but not in the gamification word per se. Uh, most of our conversations with brands are about connecting the consumer and the brand and not, like people will describe us in publications like, well, keep us gamifying advertising. We aren't fucking gamifying advertising, okay? What we're doing is we're creating an entirely new way for a consumer to engage with a brand that's through reciprocity. Where they Everybody find has to take a drink whenever he drops a chip sure. off, by the way. Uh, <laughs> where, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate it. I have an incentive now. That's my real world award. Um, sorry. But uh, I think what's really unique, though, is how these things are being executed. And I think it's a dangerous path that a lot of companies are going down right now. And that involves like the 8,000 different points you can earn. And it's really annoying, right? You'll have, oh, I can earn these points here, these points there, these points this here, this, that, and these points don't mean anything to me right now because I can't redeem it worth shit. And here's points here that I can't do anything with because I just gave, got it from a video, and this video really annoyed me, but I had to pass it because they took over my screen or something. So user experience, if I were to distill this, is a huge piece of how I think this needs to go out. And part of our model has always been about, let's not make this thing a carrot and stick. Let's not talk, turn everybody in this room into a Pavlovian dog, where I say, you do this and you get that. You're not, you're human beings. Right? So let's do something that's serendipitous. Let's do something that is based on an activity or behavior that you wanted to do yourself. So deciding to read should be a thing that you decided to do yourself, not because you're going to get a badge that says you're an intense page turner. Doesn't doesn't make me feel any better myself. Right? So when you have all these things that come to your mind, having the right user experience and being very careful about not irking your users is incredibly important. And yes, we're biased through our model, but I think it's a general statement that I hope that we all understand and continue to have a moral compass for it. Because it's very easy to block shit and make it so you can't go to the, yeah, there we go. Should I say more F words? Um, all right. Uh, it's, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this, it, 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 it's all about making sure you, you hold yourself back from, from irking your consumer base too early on. Yeah, yeah so, so I agree, content is king. 
Um, but if you're going to give me points, give me the international currency of points, which is air miles. This the whole thing. So at least do what you want, right? So that's also what we believe in, is that I'd like to give you the points that you care about. To me, I care about United Mileage Plus points, and that shit, the miles that I get is, is relevant to me, right? And to different people, there's different things that will be relevant to them. Not that we need another vote, but I think a good majority of the people here can't bother, be bothered by airline miles or other points. It's just not something on my radar. It's true. All right. Great chat. Go enjoy some beers.